Howdy, Possum Patty here. And yesterday was the first full day of spring after the vernal equinox. It was a beautiful day and Mr. Possum and Flat Stanley and I went up a few hours north of here. <laughs> it's a little bit of a drive to New Hampshire to see America's Stonehenge. A lot of people haven't heard of this place. So I did a walkthrough video last night, but this morning or today, sometime during the day today, I will get done a page or two about America's Stonehenge and our little walk into my little golden book, The Golden Egg Journal, which I am using to do my spring journaling in and also Easter memory keeping. So come on along. Well, I think I will turn to a spread that does not have any papers in the background like this so that I can use some of my magical thinking crystal moon phases <laughs> paper here and I th I have the brochure and I might just glue this down do some journaling and print out a couple of pictures I have a lot of pictures but and I can't print them all out <laughs> I can't print them all out but I'll print out a few of them and um, like I said do some journaling and just put some highlights there. It's funny when we were, um, we walked up and I didn't even think about bringing boots because the snow here is all melted and I should have thought about this. But when we got up to New Hampshire, there was snow on the ground and where there wasn't snow, there was mud. But we walked up the hill and we explored all these different stone walls and chambers and markers. It's just like this big collection of different things that were built out of stone and there's been archaeology there and some of the stone works I guess were from an early settler who had built his homestead there but he made all these strange rock chambers and I'm not sure what they were used for at different times but then they found like iron manacles so they're thinking um, maybe runaway slaves as part of the Underground Railroad had come through and they'd taken the manacles off and tossed them. And there was, um, but some of the structures seem a lot older than any settlers, you know, early American settlers. So some of the structures may have been uh, pre-Columbian, so maybe native, I thought, because it was a hilltop, maybe a sort of worshiping site uh, or sacred site to Native Americans. They found some Native American artifacts on the property. And then um, they found evidence of fire pits that were much older than that. So the brochure says, you know, it has, this spot has history going back like 4,000 years. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's quite a collection of different things, and you have to sort of read about it to, like, get the full understanding of, like, what each thing represents. So while we're up on the trail, and this is funny, while we're up on the trail, there was a guy with his, uh, you know, little four-wheeler thing with a cart in the back, and he was collecting up wood to burn, you know, to heat the house. And he had this old tattered coat on <laughs> and he, he stopped because he was coming up the trail. We were going down the trail and we were just chit-chatting. And then he started telling us all about these different rock sites around the world and these um, and the things they had found on the property and how they had excavated one of the wells that were there. And they found these quartz crystals that are down in the museum gift shop and very knowledgeable and just talking and talking and talking all about um, different things on the property. And I'm like, wow, this guy knows a lot, right? <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, 
his name was Dennis and, you know, Mr. Possum, and they shook hands after a really long conversation. And so I went back to the gift shop because, you know, you exit through the gift shop, right? And I'm looking around, and they had some stones, and, you know, you could purchase polished stones and things and crystals. And I was looking around, and I saw they had this book, America's Stonehenge, the souvenir book. So this, I have to go through and read this because this gives you a lot of detail, more detail about each numbered site and what those different things mean. So this was only $8.95, so I figured, well, that, that's a very useful, <laughs> very useful um, little book to have because, you know, all the little different things, like here's the well where they found the crystals and just different, you know, pathways and different things. So anyway, so we're going to, I'm going to, you know, go through here and, and learn more about what's going on. And there's these stones that show winter solstice and true north. And we hiked up to that one, the true north stone. And the summer solstice sunrise. Summer solstice sunset monolith. So there's a watchtower at the top and it has this dial that, and these sight lines going off that mark the sunrises and sunsets in different parts of the um, astrological calendar. <laughs> I guess you call it the astrological calendar. So astrological alignments. So on certain days of the year, they open at sunrise so people can go and take pictures of the sunrise coming up where, where these stone markers are. It's like what they do, Stonehenge over in England. So they feel that whoever created this site was well-versed in astronomy and stone construction and had placed these stone markers where, um, you know, the sunrise and sunsets and all that of the different um, seasons. I don't know if I explained that well. Anyway, I have to read the book. I have to learn more about it. But I wanted to just get a few things into the journal. Oh, so then I noticed... <laughs> completely sidetracked there, um, that this is written by the man that we were talking to up on, <laughs> up on the trail. <laughs> yeah, so Dennis Stone is the family that owns the property, and he wrote this book, and he's a retired pilot, and he's flown all over the world, and he's visited these stone sites all around the world, very knowledgeable about all these sacred stone sites and um yeah it was, it was just amazing talking to him and then he started telling us about a book he showed me the book down in the gift shop about the stone sacred stone sites here in connecticut well i didn't know there were any all right <laughs> so i just ordered the book about the stone sites in connecticut and i guess this um is 23 is going to be the year of the rock, right? Between <laughs> all the rocks that we're collecting and the stones structures that we're finding. Um, yeah, it's, this is going to be an amazing adventure this year. <laughs> Visiting all these stone sites and learning about these structures that were made, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years ago and left all over New England and New York, but I guess apparently they go across the whole country, but uh, I'll be visiting the ones that are closer by, and I just went online and found out that there's the man who wrote the book about the stone structures that are very close to where I live here and didn't know they were there, uh, is giving a lecture in April, and then they're going to do a tour later in April of one of the sites that's not open to the public. So you, the only way you can get there is by going out on these tours. So that is going to be very interesting. I can't wait for that. And I'm going to use this moon paper because it's showing the different phases of the moon and this was an astrological site, meaning the markers for the different seasons, solstice and equinoxes were there. So I, I sort of associate all that together. So 
I'm going to use this. And I, I can't tell you a whole lot about <laughs> this. Um, yeah, until I read this book. Like I said, we just went yesterday. So, you know, it, it just, you know, there was a table and uh, drains and drill marks and um, structures and, you know, just I, all kinds of things. I don't know. And they, they all have a meaning. They all, you know, they were all there for some reason or another. And so, yeah, I'm going gotta, I'm gotta to read all that. I'll, I'll be learning more this year. You know me, I love to, to learn. Lifelong learner. And hopefully we can get to some of the sites that are much closer that I didn't know were there. Like these little hidden gems everywhere that you, once you're on the trail of one thing, you kind of discover all the other ones. And people, like, you know, right? conversation with the guy who wrote the book and this this is another interesting thing his last name is stone america stonehenge is actually in rocking rockingham new hampshire <laughs> very interesting and um i was born not in new hampshire but i was born in rockland county <laughs> <laughs> All these rock things are coming up in 23. It's gorgeous paper. Now, do I need to cut another sheet or can I just do something like this? Because this is going to be on here. Or should I put that just like this? You could do that instead of cutting up another sheet, right? Right. <laughs> I wanted to, um, you know, talk. Well, I didn't have time last night because, you know, it was a long trip and we just got home. But I figured I'd just put up the slideshow, show you where we've been. And I want to talk more about all these different stone things, but I want to I wanna know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to know what I'm saying. So that means I'll have to read the book about each thing. Now this brochure is a little bit taller than the page, but I th think I will not trim it. I think I will just put it in. I don't mind things sticking up the top. I don't like them hanging out the bottom because I keep the books on the shelf, the journals on the shelf. But I always have things popping up the top. All right, so I'm going to glue all this down, print out some pictures, and I'm going to have to find something to journal on because I could journal in the black spaces with a white pen, though. It's funny, these moons look like my rose quartz I found the other day. Mr. Possum said I, <laughs> I should have made a video with a lot of talking <laughs> describing all the places at the site, but like I told you, you know, there's a whole lot here to study. There's so much at this site that it takes a while to study it all. But here I am sitting at the sun deck chamber. And the book said that this structure known as the sun deck chamber faces east and may originally have been the end of the east-west chamber. The stonework above the roof of this chamber was restored in the 1980s, and it is believed to have been modified several times. It is the lower part of the only two-story building remaining on this site. So that was pretty interesting, the way it was all put together. And then this one is Stanley pointing the way to the Oracle Chamber. <laughs> And that is one that you can walk right through the Oracle Chamber. <laughs> Sounds mysterious, doesn't it? Photos from 1915 show that the entrance to the Oracle Chamber may once have been capped off with large roof slabs. 
Just inside this chamber on the right is the upper drain. It has never been fully excavated because it disappears beneath the large stone beyond the wall. However, it still works very well to this day at keeping the chamber dry. Excavations above this area show a layer of clay that prevents the chamber from leaking. And as you're walking around this site, they have this white paint actually marking different features. And there's a lot of drains that have been chiseled away in solid stone to drain the water away from these chambers. So you go into this chamber. Here's the door here. There's the door. And then you come in. And you can see all these little niches and things all around in the chamber there. So on the opposite wall is the secret bed. This niche is large enough for a person to crawl into and be completely hidden. Almost all activity can be observed through the opening just above the floor. This niche is 76 inches long and approximately 22 inches wide. And just above the secret bed is the speaking tube. Words spoken through the stone-lined tube exit under the sacrificial table, and we'll get there in a minute, and give the impression that the table is talking. Hmm. A stone step was cut beneath the area. To the right of the secret bed and speaking tube is an opening in the ceiling. This opening once contained two pivoting stone caps that could open and close. When the site first opened to the public in 1958, these stone caps were removed and stolen. So this has been like a uh, mysterious site that you can go to since 1958, but the study of this area and the excavations go back to like the 30s or even like 1915. So there has been people at this area for a long time. And, you know, the archaeologists feel that because different groups of people have owned this property and have been working on this property and doing restoration and doing archaeology, that some of these things have got mumbled jumbled all up <laughs> and may not be like it was originally. But they keep doing research to try to make it as authentic as they can. Although this may look like a chimney, there has never been any charcoal found or discoloration of the stones that would indicate there was a fire here. And they have done different chemical carbon-14 and different kinds of testings throughout this whole area and have put um, different ages on different areas. So they think like if there were fire was being used in this area, you know, hundreds of years ago, they could kind of figure that out. Current hypotheses suggest that this was used for astronomical purposes to watch the stars and constellations as they moved across the sky. Down the passageway opposite the secret bed is a short hallway leading to the exit. On the left is a stone seat. It is believed that this large stone, weighing at least 70 tons, was already here, and another large stone, weighing approximately 45 tons, was split from the stone and moved to the opposite wall of the chamber. It was clear that a great deal of effort was put into this chamber. Now, can you imagine <laughs> hundreds or thousands of years or whenever this was built, um, people working with these stones that weighed, you know, 45 tons and 70 tons. It's amazing. Across from the seat is a small closet, one of five in the structure. The use of this closet is unknown. It is possible that at one time it held items of worship. On the left wall, just after the stone seat, is a very weathered inscription outlined in white. It is a carving known as the running deer carving, though recent research suggests it may actually be the carving of an Iberian ibex. Hmm. It is believed that opposite this carving was a window instead of the exit that is here today, which was likely created by vandals. And then, so I have this, the doorway leading, looking out from inside, looking out of that chamber. 
and then the speaking tube goes from the chamber and comes out underneath the sacrificial table, which right now has a tarp on it because of vandals. I'll get to that in a minute. The sacrificial table weighs four and a half tons and was quarried from an area underneath the astronomical viewing platform. There's, the bedrock is very close to the surface. As we were hiking around, we could actually see the bedrock right at the surface in several places. And, and I believe uh, there talks about uh, a quarry being on the site at one time too, where they were taking slabs of the stone out. It is believed to have been used for sacrifice, not only because of its size, but also because of the oracle speaking tube beneath it and the trapezoidal groove channel on the surface. If this was used as a sacrificial stone, the type of sacrifice, whether it be humans or animals, <laughs> would depend on the culture that settled on the site. One of the reasons ancient cultures might sacrifice is to keep the sun from permanently setting off the face of the earth. As they watched the sun set further and further along the horizon, they offered sacrifices to stop it from setting off. Because around the solstices, the sun seems to stand still for a few days, to these people it may have seen that the sacrifices they offered to please the sun allowed it to return to its normal path in the sky. There were many ancient cultures that sacrificed both humans and animals. Some cultures that sacrificed animals would be Greeks, Romans, and Aztecs. Other cultures believed to have sacrificed humans include many pre-Columbian civilizations of Central America, Celts, Phoenicians, and Carthaginians, early Romans, and Inca. Aztecs were also known to make a daily sacrifice in the morning to aid the sun in rising. We may never be sure exactly what the massive table might have been used for, but it is clear that it was a significant element in the function of the site and required much labor and skill to construct. And there's a picture of it there. You can see the walls of the chamber around it. So this is looking down at the top of the table there. So why does it have a tarp on it now? Well, in 2019, back September 28th, 2019, a person, <laughs> a person went in there with power tools and defaced the stone. He, um, he first of all, he knocked you know, it's sitting up on these large stones, like stone legs. And somehow he knocked those out, and it, it kind of fell down a little bit. And then with these power tools, he actually, like, carved, <laughs> carved, I am Mark. <laughs> I don't know. He, he carved um, another message in there, and he erected a cross, and I don't he just... He destroyed it. It was like, this thing is like thousands of years old. And nobody's really sure what it was used for. I mean, they call it the sacrificial table because, you know, that makes people want to come see it. Some people think that, oh, that's just a stone uh, that they used to make soap on. <laughs> they used lye to make lye soap on. Or, you know, they come up with all different things. So... You know, we might never know what that was for. I don't think there's anything in the records about the uh, the guy that lived there, the first family, the Patty family. I know, the Patty family, right? <laughs> the Patty family. It's not spelled Patty. It's P-A-T-T-E-E. -E. The Patty family owned the property. I just have to laugh. The Patty family opened the pro owned the property, and now the man who owns it, his name is Dennis Stone. <laughs> and this is the fellow we were talking to while we were there. And it is in Rockingham County. So, I mean, <laughs> this whole thing was just, like, so funny. Anyway, what was not funny was the destruction of this table. And... Uh, 
the owners were just heartbroken. I mean, this has been in the family since the 1950s, and they have been caretakers of this property. And, you know, with restorations and archaeology and, you know, all this going on there. And they've, they've, this family has just spent their life caring for this property and, and learning more about it and, you know, trying to put in all these, um, you know, the knowledge that you need to understand this. And this guy comes along and in one night with power tools tries to destroy the, like, the centerpiece, the centerpiece of this whole place, right, is this table around which all these chambers were built. And um, to this day, he's, he's devastated. Yeah, we were talking to him. He is just so devastated. So he got a, a restoration expert to come, and, and they put it back up and to fill in you know, where he had taken his power tools and carved into the stone, you know, with, with like a stone mixture to fill it in, kind of restore it. Um, but it, it is just very, you know, it's compromised. It's just so sensitive now that in the wintertime, if water gets in there, you know, and freezes and expands and contracts, you know, it could just split it apart again. So they have to be very careful with it. And in the wintertime, they put the tarp on it and hope that it will be okay. I might have a little extra room on this page. I think I'm going to, I've got two of these. I had one, Mr. Possum had one. Cut out this little map. Just put something interesting on the page there. So I was trying to research about this event, and a couple years after it happened, they, they caught the guy who did it because, yeah, social media, he bragged on social media that he did it, and they, um, he was in New Jersey, I guess, and they took him to court, but it was this whole, you yeah, know, it was, it was like one big fiasco. Well, the guy, you know, he, he's a little wacky about this site, and uh, he was a zealot, and, you know, he, you know, he just, like, you know, maybe he's not competent, you know, and they wound up, like, you know, like, he, he barely got charged with anything. I don't know. He didn't have to pay a fine. He didn't have to go to jail. Um, you know, he should have paid for the restoration and, and rest, rest restoration, sorry, not the restoration, the restoration of the stone, and I, I think nothing, you know, like, like nothing happened to this guy besides going to court, and, you know, they, they, you know, said to the owner, you know, well, you know, you know, you want him to come apologize, and the owner's like, no, I don't even want to see him, I don't want to meet him, because, you know, he just destroyed something that y you can't replace it, I mean, you can try to restore it, but you know, it's just never going to be the same, and it's not something you can replace. Like if you carve your initials in a park bench, you can replace a park bench. But if you destroy, you know, a piece of history that may be thousands of years old, you know, it's like, you know, he just, it's just crazy. You, you just, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> What are you going to do? It just, you know, it just some people are just so wacky. Yeah, and if you don't like the idea that these people are calling it a sacrificial table or whatever, you know, so what? You know, that's that's their research. That's what they believe it is or could be, you know, could just be a place where they made soap. What 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 whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I mean, are you going to go to South America? South America and destroy all the remnants of the Aztec and Inca civilizations because maybe they sacrificed humans. You know, you, just, you can't do that stuff. This is this is history. This is just history and, you know, I don't know. Sorry, I'm on a rant. <laughs> I'm on a rant. It just, you know, I'm just so upset that, you know, just talking to the owner and, and listening to his angst about this being done to something that is so old and the family has cared for for so long. 
just terrible just so sad so sad anyway so that's a little bit about the site there's other things too you know the, the couple of wells where they found quartz crystals and artifacts and you know things like glasses from the colonial days and, and slave manacles and you know things that there was a quarry there there you know there was a colonial dwelling there at some places on the site there were you know places where the indians and native americans had you know campsites and they found arrowheads and old pottery and you know just so much history there not not just one culture you know <laughs> several different peoples and cultures that have come through this site and use it for different things. So, you know, it's just so interesting. And, you know, we need to go back and learn some more about it. I'm just looking for the cap of my glue. Um, but also, I think we're going to try and get a tour of the place that is similar to it, but here in Connecticut. So that's going to be interesting, too. It's not a commercial place like this is. Um... And you have to, you can't just go any time. You have to only go when they have special groups and you have to sign up and all that stuff. So I'm going to see if we can get to be part of a tour for the place that is closer to us. Place here in Connecticut. And that's going to be interesting too. So, you know, Stanley's been watching these rock hounding adventures. <laughs> Different rock hounders on YouTube. And there's one that he loves to watch and, you know... He ends his video with, go everywhere, see everything. So I think that's Stanley's new motto. <laughs> go everywhere, see everything, especially if it involves rocks. So thanks for coming along today and happy junk journaling. Bye-bye. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to talk about that was in the first video. And that's just one place. There was this one chamber. And it was, you know, the first sunrise after the vernal equinox. So that was Tuesday morning. And the sun was coming in over my shoulder and shining through the doorway of this one chamber. And there was some snow melt on the floor of this one particular chamber because there was still quite a bit of snow around. And when that sun hit that water, it was so magical. It just reflected up the side of the chamber on the rocks. Just this really cool light reflecting on the inside wall of the chamber. And I was standing there and Mr. Possum took a picture of me because the sun was going in and out from behind the cloud. And every time I went to take a picture of it, the sun would go behind the cloud and it would stop. And I'd stand there and then all of a sudden it would appear again and I'd try to take a picture of it and then it would disappear. So it took me a few minutes of standing there to get this really pretty water reflecting on the inside wall of the chamber. Very magical. This was a very magical place indeed. Okay, bye again. Bye-bye.